Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Pentax MZ10 which was launched in 1996 alongside its sister camera the MZ5. Uh, the MZ5 features more conventional styling with a traditional shutter speed dial uh, and uh, an exposure compensation dial on, on this side whereas the MZ10 was intended to be a much more stylish and futuristic looking thing. Essentially the cameras did very similar functions. Both the MZ5 and the MZ10 were targeted at the enthusiast amateur market uh, and did a pretty good job and offered a reasonable specification for a very modest sum of money. In America and only in America these are known as the ZX5 and the ZX10. Um, the rest of the world though are the MZ range. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at this and we're going to start as always by popping in some batteries. This camera uses two CR2 batteries that sit underneath this panel here. These are uh, Duracell cells which happen to come with the camera. I would normally personally use any brand other than Duracell but that's what we've got today. So there we go, we're up and running. The control layout at first might look a bit weird. There's funny lines and colours and things all over the show. So let's um, get into that and, and see what we can find out. So on off is pretty straightforward. And we're going to start, there's a little uh, black index here. And whatever you line up against that is what you're going to be using. So I'm going to start in the green picked mode, which is program mode. And we can see on this display here, we have a range of um, pictograms with a green smiley face, uh, a head and shoulder portrait, a landscape, a macro flower and a sports running chappy. Uh, and in the green mode, it will automatically select between those uh, options. They're all programmed, they're all set the shutter speed and the aperture for you. If you have a lens that has the little A marker on it, it will use the six segment evaluative metering that the camera has as well. But as we look at this, whoo, let's turn the autofocus on. But at the moment we're in infinity focus and the camera has decided to highlight the landscape mode. So it's going to prioritise a smaller aperture over a faster shutter speed and try and get us a bit more depth of field. As we uh, focus a little bit nearer, however, we're clearly not taking landscapes at two metres, so it's assuming we're taking a portrait and it goes to a shallower depth of field. And then as we move progressively on from there, it goes to the macro focus mode and again it prioritises depth of field. So really landscape and macro kind of do the same thing um, and sport and portrait you could argue do the same thing because they're going to choose a wider aperture at a uh, faster shutter speed. But nonetheless it gives you a little built-in expert. I'm focusing manually it works just the same in autofocus it's just easier to show. It's also dependent on the focal length although I think with this lens it's probably not going to make a lot of difference, not uh, in the environment we're in. So that's the built-in expert picked mode. So if you're totally new to photography and you want to take good quality photographs straight away, go for that. It'll, it'll give you a slightly better picture than in just a straightforward program mode. If you move to the regular picked mode with the black lettering, not the green, we then can cycle ourselves between the program functions. Uh, that function doesn't work in the green mode. So the green mode effectively is the, for want of a better expression, the idiot mode, fully automatic. It'll optimise the exposure for what it believes the subject to be. In the regular program mode, or picked mode, we can choose our own program. Now in both of those modes you can see it says AV aperture value or what we used to call aperture priority and if we take the lens out of its automatic setting press the button and turn we then get aperture value exposure. 
Now it's worth noting that one of the most uh, popular Pentax cameras of the you know, late 70s, early 80s was the ME Super, and that offered aperture value and manual exposure. So right here we've got a camera that's a very similar size to an ME Super. If anything, it's a little bit lighter in weight. And right now I'm using it in aperture priority. The advantage I'm getting over an ME Super, of course, is I've got the better exposure system, the six segment evaluative metering. I've got a built-in film winder. That has a continuous mode as well at two frames a second, which is not too bad for an entry-level camera. Um, so really, I've got everything an ME Super offers um, in a more modern thing. Plus I've got autofocus, of course, which can be a boon. Uh, now if I move away from the picked modes and go to TVM, with the lens not on A, I've got full manual control. Set the aperture on the lens, set the shutter speed using the control wedge. If I put the lens back onto A, I get shutter priority. So I choose the shutter speed and the camera chooses a complementary aperture. I'll come back to manual in just a moment. ISO set, we can manually set the ISO for the camera. The camera does have DX coding and the DX coding range is from 25 to 5000 ISO. So a full DX coding suite of film speeds there. But if you uh, like to use a uh, weird and wonderful non-DX coded film, uh, perhaps the sort of thing you might get from Analog Wonderland where it's been a, a cine film that's repackaged into a 35mm cassette, you can manually set the ISO range and then you can choose between 6 and 6400 ISO. So quite a quite a significant ISO range there. Um, but let's go back to manual. This camera uses what's called the KAF2 mount. So it's a standard Pentax K or KA bayonet. Uh, we've got the addition of the electronic contacts that we first saw in cameras like the Super A and Program A. Plus we've got an additional seventh electronic pin um, for uh, focal length data. And then we've got the two gold pins here which provide power for those lenses that have a powered zoom. So uh, there, were, there were one or two cameras that came out with cameras like the Z10 where instead of having a mechanical zoom ring you twisted it a little way and the lens zoomed in and out. Um, they didn't really catch on. but. They will work on this to a limited degree. Now we can also, because it's a standard Pentax bayonet, use an old manual lens. And basically old manual lenses come in two flavours. This is an M. So you'll either see SMC M or SMC Pentax M. And then you get an A version where you have manual focus. But in addition to the regular aperturing, you get the A setting as we have on this autofocus lens. So let's go ahead and pop that on the camera. Now this really is turning it into an ME Super with a built-in winder. You could buy a winder for an ME Super, so it's a perfectly reasonable comparison. I uh, am currently in manual mode. Yep, that's right. So I choose my aperture on the lens, choose my shutter speed on the camera. When you use a non-A series lens, or a pre-A series lens, uh, you lose a six segment evaluative metering. You only get uh, a centre weighted average metering, just like an ME Super. Now if I go to the either of the picked modes, which are also my AV modes, I've now got aperture value or aperture priority automatic. Again, just like an ME Super, and again with the centre weighted average metering. So if you have any legacy Pentax lenses, uh, you can use those on an MZ10 or an MZ5 perfectly happy, happily, just as if you use them on an ME Super or an MX or an ME or, or an MV or any of those series of Pentax cameras. But for now I'm going to pop the kit lens, the 3580 on.
those are the exposure modes we've covered the film winding there's also a self timer of course uh, we have up to three stops exposure compensation in the automatic exposure modes push the button turn the dial uh, and that can be very handy on this side we've got our manual autofocus switch so I'm just going to put that into autofocus and there's no, no contrast here so you can see it's quite a zippy autofocus system and on that point one thing I didn't mention on the lens mount is we have a little autofocus drive shaft here the Pentax system has a, a motor in the body just like the original Minolta did and the Nikon for that matter and then on the lens there is a corresponding drive shaft there and in fact if you take a screwdriver and turn that in the drive shaft you'll see the focus ring turn it's as simple as that the Canon system on the EOS was to put the motor in the lens which technically is a little bit better um, the Canon camera of the same era would be an EOS 500N and there's very little to choose between them um, this has three stops of exposure compensation and two frames a second on the winder the Canon is two stops and one frame a second but the Canon does have uh, a kind of partial or spot metering as well as evaluative metering uh, and it does have the excellent Canon A depth mode which uh, nobody really understood how to use so I'm not sure how much benefit it is to anybody but it was a good idea uh, if you have legacy Pentax lenses obviously you, you're going to be more tempted to buy a Pentax uh, and if you have legacy Canon lenses, Canon EF lenses the Canon 500N would be a great choice as well similar camera, similar prices uh, but moving on, that's the autofocus manual focus it's a three point autofocus system, not wildly sophisticated but quite quite quick um, and, and reliable now there is an option for, to automate the pop-up flash you can set the flash to pop up automatically or not using that button or you can choose to pop the flash unit up now as you can see on this particular camera after 25 years it doesn't really pop up anymore so we're going to have to help it a little bit by uh, propping it up ourselves that spring has gone but that's okay built-in flash units generally aren't terribly good they may be okay for a, a splash of fill-in flash mm, this one's not working at all they may be okay for a splash of fill-in flash in daylight uh, or to set off a studio flash with a, with a slave unit perhaps but that's about it looking inside should point out this camera's fitted with a data back um, you could buy it with or without this it will print either the date or the time on your photographs the battery in this one is dead I'm simply not minded to replace it because I don't really want horrible numerals printed on my photographs all modern and polycarbonate inside so as we've seen on other cameras there's a ridge that runs along the camera back sits in a little groove in the camera body and that forms your light leak of course it does have this inspection window so if you're a little worried about the foam rubber letting light in as they sometimes do a little bit of black tape over the window will resolve that problem as i said earlier uh, dx coding from 25 to 5000 we've got a full suite of contacts in there nice simple film loading simply get your film up to this orange marker you do have to make sure the lead is just underneath this um, guide uh, if you put it over the top of that it's not going to work obviously I do have a film here in fact so just drop it in close the back and there we go it's read the film speed it's loaded the film and we get a confirmation one of the great things about these uh, more modern 35mm SLRs is it does tell you for sure if you loaded the film correctly or not um, and that's pretty much it the only thing left on this is not very much on the base plate uh, a nice metal tripod thread if you want to take out the film prematurely you get a pen and stick it in there there's an old premature film rewind otherwise when you get to the end of your roll of film 
uh, it will re rewind automatically. I did just want to have a little word about this lens though. And also about the viewfinder display. So at around this time people were coming into camera shops with perfectly nice ME Supers, Minolta X300s, Canon AV1s, AE1s, all of that sort of thing. And almost to a man they had a 50mm lens on it. They probably had a wide angle lens, a 35 or 28, and usually they would have a 70 to 210. So a classic three lens set on a manual focus, partially automatic camera. And what everybody wanted, of course, was autofocus, which is a fantastic assistant. The thing being, they wanted to get an autofocus camera for around about £300, but they also wanted to upgrade from a prime 50mm lens to a zoom lens. They wanted more flexibility in their standard lens. Now you can get good quality, even exceptional quality, zoom lenses, but not with a camera body at £300. This lens on its own is about, or was about, the same price as a 50mm 1.7 AF and you can't have the complexity of the mechanical arrangement here. You can't get a lens that does 35, 50 and 80 all in one lens for the same price as a 50mm and expect it to be just as good a quality. So these kit lenses, um, if it's the only lens you've got obviously then, then go for it. Um, but it's really a stopgap to something else. Um, if you have legacy manual focus lenses then that will be terrific. Uh, if you've got the ones with the automatic A aperture on the SM, SMC A's or SMC Pentax A's or the FA's or I believe the DA's also work on this essentially any lens that says A on it <clears throat> even better you'll get the evaluative metering. So uh, we did get a, a, a series of people that would buy a camera like this, whether it's a Pentax or another brand, with the kit zoom, and two or three months later they'd come back in with wallets of photographs from their photo developer, and they say, we, we're perfectly happy with the camera, but when we look at our photographs, they're just not as sharp as we used to get with our old ME Super, and we spent £300 on this, and understandably they were concerned. And whilst we did try to explain at the time they bought the camera that the standard kit lens was okay but not remarkable um, not everybody um, took it on board some people did spend an extra 300 pounds getting the 35 105 or the 28 105 type lenses um, but it's quite a hard sell if you're only buying a camera that costs two or three hundred pounds to then say you're going to have to spend another 300 pounds just to get to the same quality as your 50mm 1.7 on your ME Super. Um, so people wanted the autofocus, they also wanted the zoom. Um, and you don't always get everything at the price that you want. One thing I didn't mention incidentally, there is a port on the side here to take the uh, fairly standard Pentax remote release. That's the same remote release as I used all the way from the SFX onwards. That was one of their first autofocus SLR cameras. The other thing I just wanted to mention is um, cameras for people joining film photography for the first time. Some people would say uh, what's the best camera to learn photography on? And we had this when these cameras were new as well. We'd have people going to college to study A-level photography and the curriculum required them to have a camera capable of full or uh, full manual exposure, I beg your pardon. Um, oftentimes, when that question is posed, people will say, best starter camera in the world is a Pentax K1000 or a Pentax Spotmatic. Basically, the K1000 is the same thing, but with a bayonet mount on it. And these are... These and the K1000s are terrific cameras, and the Spotmatic in particular, uh, give credit where it's due, the Spotmatic was the first camera 
first 35mm SLR camera ever to have through the lens built-in exposure metering. So it is a genuinely cutting edge camera for its day. That was uh, 1964, it was announced, went on sale in 1965. Uh, we'll cover this in, a, in another video in due course. Uh, and it will teach you all you need to know about marketing. And this is fine. This, if you want to learn about photography, this will do the job admirably. I would never fault anybody for buying a Spotmatic or a K1000. Um, but many people looking for their camera for their A-level course would confuse fully manual with fully mechanical. And the two aren't necessarily the same thing. So it's a little bit tricky to photograph uh, viewfinder displays, but I've given it my best shot with these two. And the reason I'm making this point is because the MZ10 and generally modern autofocus cameras are actually easier to use in manual exposure than older manual only cameras are. And there's a simple reason for that. So when we look at the viewfinder display for the Spotmatic or the K1000, uh, it's it's not as bright is the first thing and of course all we're seeing is a match needle exposure uh, on the right hand side of the viewfinder and that works perfectly well nothing wrong with that um, however when we look at the MZ10 we see a much brighter viewfinder to start with and then on the right hand side a very clear LED indicator um, if you get one of the very basic entry-level cameras, uh, like a Casino CT1 or a, a Vivitar V353, again, perfectly good cameras, but you, the LEDs, there is a, a plus and a minus and a green circle. So it's either under or over or correct. But there's no indication of how far under or over you might be. Um, with the MZ10, as you can see in the viewfinder picture, you've got a very clear scale that shows you up to two stops under or overexposure. So if you wanted to overexpose a little bit to compensate for a white wedding dress or a lot of sky in the scene, you can see very clearly um, on the viewfinder display when that happens. And also, that that's to my mind, we're also seeing the shutter speed and the aperture displayed. Uh, I can't see that in the viewfinder of the K1000 or the Spotmatic. So I've got a very clear viewfinder, very easy to read, with an indication of how far under or overexposed I am. Uh, and it's a brighter viewfinder as well. So as much as this is a terrific and indeed groundbreaking camera, if you want to learn about photography in manual exposure mode, maybe get an MZ10 or a 500N Canon or something of that nature. A Minolta 7000 will be terrific as well. Now I just want to take the film out of here. So as you can see it winds the film leader into the cassette so you don't mistake that for a, a new roll of film. There's one last last thing I forgot to mention which is I think every camera from the 1990s has this the panorama mode. So this brings a couple of curtains in front of the shutter at the top and the bottom and reduces the size of your negative. And then when it's printed, it's printed 10 inches long instead of 6 inches long. So you get a 4x6 panorama. Sounds like a good idea, but in reality it just adds to the cost of your processing and reduces the quality because it is at the end of the day just a selective enlargement. Uh, now this being a high quality camera, when you do this you do at least get a clear indicator in the viewfinder that you're in the panorama mode. Um, some cameras, particularly cheaper ones and, and compact cameras, they'll just have a little dotted line and you just have to remember that that dotted line is the framing when you're in, um, in the panorama mode. So there we go. Um, you can find these for sale quite readily. Um, easily under £50, frequently under £20, um, with, usually with the, the 35 to 80 lens, which would certainly get you started. Um, terrific cameras, really nice, small, lightweight, all the features you need. 
Some people would, would point out it doesn't have, um, well, what doesn't it have? It doesn't have multiple exposure functions. It doesn't have a diopter correction built in for the viewfinder. Uh, it doesn't have depth of field preview. And you know what else didn't have those things? An ME Super. So very much um, targeted at that enthusiast consumer. And for, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds, what more could you really ask for from a, a 35mm SLR? I haven't taken any test photographs with this for the simple reason it is a modern 35mm camera. The photographs will be as near as makes no difference perfect. The choice of film and as I said before the choice of lens will have a much bigger bearing on the quality of your image than whether you shot it on an MZ10 or an MZ5 or a Minolta 7000 or anything else. Um, so there's little point in if you've seen a photograph before, then you've seen the sort of photograph that this can produce. It's it's as good as it gets really. Um, obviously, it's not a pro camera. There's no weather sealing. Uh, there's no um, uh, metal uh, construction in here. So it is. It does feel very solid. I have to say, the actual fit and finish of the camera is excellent. There's no play in the body at all. No matter how you try and flex or twist it. Um, so yeah, couldn't, couldn't recommend it highly enough. Great little camera. Um, this particular one, I know my brother is looking for a Pentax Fit camera body to replace one he had where the battery's corroded in it. So I'm probably going to send this one to him now um, and hopefully he will take up film photography again. Anyway, that's been the MZ10. I hope this video has been of use to somebody. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for watching. I do appreciate it.